Next up, we have Barry Bulo giving a talk called Using KiCad in a Neoden for Pick and Place. Barry is a retired avionics engineer from Rockwell Collins in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. During his career, Barry has worked on, a, on every Boeing airplane in production, including being part of the team designing the large format LCD for the 787 and the autopilot system on all models. Please welcome them to the stage. I'm vertically challenged there. So, uh, Good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about using the Neoden uh, pick-and-place machine. Uh, d does anybody in the crowd already have a pick-and-place of some kind? We got one, two, okay. The one here. Okay, very good. And um, so a pick-and-place is for SMD only. And it uh, picks up, there's a moving head that picks up a part and goes over and sticks it where it's supposed to go on the surface of the board. And, and this machine is physically, it's, it's a desktop. It's not a giant uh, high, high production rate unit. There are multiple nozzles in there that pick up various size components. And, but this is the machine that's about the least expensive that has vision. And that's a huge deal. Because uh, although you don't need to, to maybe check every resistor, for all the ICs you're going to put down that have fine pitch, it goes over and takes a picture of the part once it's picked it up and looks at the, in the software, it looks at that and it'll reorient it, whatever. So it goes over and puts it down in the right place uh, with those corrections in it. And uh, at my age, I need that. <laughs> Uh, then here's the machine when it was first delivered. Uh, FedEx brought it and uh, uh, came palletized, and that, that box was on top of it. And here it is in my shop. And I put, got a whole new rack to put it on and things. And then I've got crates for each project, little bins. So uh, I'm going to talk first of all about in KiCad, what would you do if you're going to do pick and place? And, and so First of all, there's some things you want to do in the schematic. Uh, there's some uh, part selection issues, which is really, really huge. And then there's PCDB layout. You need things like fiducials and edge rails and that sort of thing. And in the, in the schematic, you need to think about what the implementation is going to be. Do I want to have a certain kind of connector? Uh, where is that going to be? That sort of thing. Uh, I, I believe very much in development process. Uh, that may not mean much to anybody who isn't in an, a rigorous industry situation, but, but uh, there's a whole lot to be learned from prior mistakes, prior programs, prior everything. And uh, the uh, a huge aside, uh, the, the uh, Software Engineering Institute has something called CMMI, the Capability Maturity Model. Okay, you can, there's thousands of pages written about that. Go see the first four pages <laughs> of uh, CMMI, and it'll teach you a lot about uh, being more mature and learning as you go. Uh, let's see. The, uh, the layout issues, where do you want test points, where do connectors go? And, and my last item is have a mechanical layout in mind from the very beginning. Okay. So, so parts. Uh, I standardized, I consciously standardized on 805 because they're big enough you can work them with your hands and a, a pair of Harbor Freight magnifying glasses. <laughs> I, I advised the Iowa State solar car team and those guys went off and built a lot of boards with 402 size parts because we can. And it's like, that's not the right <laughs> reason to build things with 402 parts. If it's a cell phone and it's got to be that big, but they want to take the car to Australia and go through the, the dust and, and to do rework out there. And it's like, you're going to do 402 parts in the middle of nowhere? So um, there's, there's a lot to be said for standardizing. Uh, in some respects, I wish I maybe had gone to 603, but I'm, but I'm at 805, and that's where I'm staying. Um, I, as, as time has gone on, I've gotten more comfortable with doing like TSSOPs on the machine, and I'm really becoming a fan of the leadless parts. 
Uh, there are some RF devices that only come in leadless, and I'm, I'm really getting to be more happy with those. If you make your own footprint for something, it is essential, okay, that you, when you've got that part up on the screen, that you put zero, zero in the middle of the part because it uses the, 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 all the math involved in the mechanics. It picks the part up and it's going to place the part in the middle of the footprint. Okay, if you had zero, zero up here and here's your footprint, it's going to try and put the part over that zero, zero. So that's, and nobody ever tells you that other than today. <coughs> okay, so uh, here's, going to switch now to, to, to PCB layout, uh, board size, fiducials, uh, paneling, that sort of thing, and then uh, stencils. Okay, so here's a board that I did, and uh, I don't have a laser pointer here, but way down in the left corner is a fiducial. Uh, and it's, it's just a little dot. There's a separate library in KiCad for those things, and it's in the copper layer. And then in the far upper right, there's a little yellow dot, and that's also a fiducial. So when the machine, when the board gets first put into the machine, it goes over, and you've taught it these things, but you type in to the setup the x, y coordinates. The camera moves over, and it takes One, two, okay. So the camera comes over here and it takes a picture about this big. Okay. The camera comes over and takes a picture of about this area. And, and then it says, uh, I went to the XY that you told me, but the board is in the machine just a little bit crooked or a little too far or a little too far back. <clears throat> and it takes three successive pictures. It pictures it finds the center of that circle, makes a correction, takes a second picture, m mechanically moves and makes a second correction, takes a third picture and makes a third correction. So at that point, the registration between the machine and the circuit board is off by, you know, 0 0.01 millimeters, some tiny, relatively tiny number. I don't need both of these on. Okay. Um, so, so after it's found that registration fiducial, it moves up and finds the second registration fiducial. <clears throat> okay. so, so after finding those two fiducial marks, it now knows that the circuit board, even though I told it it was square, is sitting in there skewed one way or the other, or whatever. So those, those two alignment marks get the machine's brain and the physical board in synchronization registered. Okay. If you have multiple panel, if you've got a panel that has multiple boards, so I'll do a small board, I'll do two wide and five high. It does that for each of the boards as each of the panel, each of the boards on the panel as it goes through. So the, the, the error is, is way, way reduced from uh, this board, a large board, has a larger error than a small board would. Okay. D does everybody understand that I make that reasonably clear? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, talking about PCBs, when, <clears throat> when professionally, when we would go and uh, make a new circuit design, uh, you can't start the pre PC board layout until the mechanical engineer comes in and says, this is how big the board's going to be. This is where the mounting holes are going to go. You've got this TO220 part that needs a heat sink screw. That's going to go over here. So that all that mechanical work you've got to do first. I see more boards, particularly from students, because I interact with them a lot, and it is crazy. <clears throat> the mounting hole was the last thing they thought of. Okay, it should be number one. Um, and and by the way, this item here, eBay, is full of nice little boxes. They're, they're extruded boxes being squirted out in China, and they're, and they're like a dollar or two dollars for little bitty, and they've got boards or little bitty enclosures with slide-in uh, rails. And you, you, you're, you're foolish to not 
use something like that or have something like that in mind. Uh, and uh, when you put down mounting holes and you put down fiducials, um, lock those, okay? Uh, and there's been some discussion on the forums about uh, the lock feature. The, the reason you need to lock them is because if you do some global select and move something, uh, it'll pick that fiducial up and move it, and you really don't want to do that. Okay. And I use a, a standard uh, copper top. It's called to, in, the, uh, in the fiducial category. And then the other thing I do is uh, I have a lot of boards, and I'm old, and I forget. Okay. So in the silk screen on the back of the board, b behind the fiducial is the XY coordinate. So before I put it in the machine, I can look at that and go, oh, yeah, that's the coordinate of this fiducial. Here's the coordinate of this other fiducial. It's just a simple little thing to do. <clears throat> the other thing I always do is put the, uh, use the auxiliary axis, and I put that in the lower left corner. So the numbers are first quadrant, positive x, positive y. Uh, panels and stencils. Okay, so... Um, sorry to the vendors, but I've been ordering from JLC uh, cheap. What can I say? Uh, um, and uh, I buy the stencil from them without a frame, and it's $6. Uh, that is outrageously cheap for a stencil. I'm sorry. <laughs> Drew. Uh, so um, at any rate, um, their stencils have been very good. I, I'm quite happy with the quality of them. I've cut myself numerous times with the sharp edges on them, but um, the, uh, their web page is horrible. They, they don't consistently do what they call X and Y changes from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. Um, so be aware of that. And, and the stencils I get are unframed. I had a buddy of mine who's a woodworker. He took a nice sheet of plywood and he milled out a hole for me that fits that stencil, and uh, it's on a hinge like a toilet seat kind of a thing. <clears throat> I got a jig, and I put the, put the board in, bring the stencil down, and get it aligned, and uh, then I use uh, a credit card to uh, put the squeegee on the, uh, the, the uh, solder paste. And uh, by the way, order your solder paste from DigiKey this time of year while it's cold and won't get all, <laughs> won't get all cooked in the summer uh, shipping. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, for the finer pitch parts, the TSSOPs and the leadless, uh, that solder paste is um, a, a very difficult technical step to get that uniform. That, that at this point, my entire uh, s slightly ad hoc process is that uh, putting, down the, uh, putting down the paste. <clears throat> um, what else here? Okay, so, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk now about switching from just talking about KiCad to switching about Neoden. Um, the Neoden machine is uh, a very has some very very nice features. Basically, in the bottom of it, there's a, a PC running a, a version of Windows uh, off of a uh, USB stick or something. I'm not quite sure, but but at any rate, uh, there's no hard disk in it, and um, so uh, it comes up, and uh, it has very limited use as an actual PC because it's in Chinese. And, and so they've written this uh, interface in, in English, and uh, it, it is uh, OK. Uh, how's that for a glowing review? Huh? It's OK. So um, at any rate, in, in KiCad, there's some things we do to uh, to produce the file, okay, and so we make uh, there's a there's a file export position file, and that spits out a uh, comma separated value file, and um, here's what it looks like. Now, I didn't intend for people to actually read that, but that that's just a a, a column of the the part number, reference designator, the value, the package. The position of x, the position of y. That x and y is the center, okay, at 
356-1044, that is the center of capacitor one. Okay. Now, we have to massage that a little bit to get it into the standard uh, file for uh, neoden. And so I take that file and uh, just open it in Excel or, uh, or uh, Open Office, whatever you like. And uh, you have to just pick some columns out, pick the whole column, move it over, just rearrange columns. You, you don't have to add two and two. There's no numbers. It's just sort of a pick it and, and uh, stick it in the right column. And then you need these particular row of headers here. Uh, the, uh, the Neoden software is looking for this row of headers. So it's, it's the reference designator, uh, footprint, mid X, mid Y. That's what came from the KiCad file. Then it's also got these other reference XY and uh, pad XY. Those are the same values just copied over. So the, literally there's, there's three columns, that, three pairs of columns that have the same data. Then, then top means this is the top board of the board, and uh, top the T has to be capital letters, <laughs> and then over here is the rotation of the part. Which way is it going to face? Okay, so um, let's see where am I? So uh, it's just open the file, shuffle some things around, save it. Then you take it to the Neoden and you stick the USB in and you read it in, and <clears throat> that aligns the, uh, that, that reads from the, the relative zero, zero of your, of your uh, reference, of your design, to the machine coordinates, okay? And what it does is you had to tell the, the Neoden machine, you put a board in the machine and you say, here is the first component, C1 in this case. So you go over and you align visually, you drive the, the, the head over and you say, this spot is where C1 goes. And at that point, it converts from, you know, 50-1, comma 100 to the machine units of uh, 253, comma, uh, whatever number. So, so that is a, is a registration step that's done in Neodent's setup. But everything after that, the machine has converted it to its internal units. So here's, the, then, it's, then you save that Neoden file on the machine. I bring that back, uh, out of that Neoden, back to, and look at the, at the uh, columns. And there, okay. so over here are various feeders, and these were on the side. These are tapes of, uh, and I've got, a, one of the manufacturers talked about using standard values. I have parts in my machine that I never take off. 10 ohms, 47, 100, 470, 1K, 4.7, 10K, 100K. Then 100 picofarads, 0 0.001, blah, 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 on up. I've got four LED colors in it. I've got an op, a standard op amp I use for most everything. Those reels never come off. On big machines, they have cassettes. They have a piece of sheet metal that's like this big, and you put the reel on it, and you, it's got the feeder and everything, and it goes in and out. <clears throat> that's a $100,000 machine or some number I don't really know, okay? On, on the $10,000 $10, machine, you got to feed those all by hand, and, it, and it's painful, so I don't do it. <laughs> okay, and I've got to keep rolling here. I'm going to run out of time. So there's my standard... Uh, in the old days at Collins, it used to be the PSPL was the preferred standard parts list. If you don't have a preferred standard, you should make one. <laughs> make a list of the things that you use the most, because then you just go buy uh, a 500 or a 1,000 of the 1Ks or something like that. So here's some, some screenshots. I'm sorry these are not perfect, but this is the monitor hooked up to the Neoden. So over on the left side there are the setups of where are these, where do we find things on the board? Are there panels? How many, how many uh, boards are in a panel? That sort of thing. Um, the uh, Neoden software is, uh, it's sort of uh, everything you'd expect it to be from somebody who didn't necessarily have user friendly as a high priority. Um, you, you have this, all, a lot of these alignment issues to go through, but at any rate, uh, the first 
part in the bill of materials that gets loaded in, don't ever change that because it changes the registration and that computation is only done once. There's no go back and redo that. <clears throat> then for each of the feeders, there are uh, settings of uh, where, is the f where is that feeder and you visually drive the head around and the camera looks at it and you say, here's where you go to get all of your 10 ohm resistors. And there's a feeder that advances the tape and so then you set the height of it. A lot, a lot of that you do it once and it's there forever. And then this is the, the final uh, page in the NeoDen after it's, uh, it's, you've taught it where all the parts come from and, uh, and on the right side here is where they're gonna go to. So here's a close up of a feeder. So the head is the big black part. And so this, this moves around uh, and it, I've, I run the thing at 30% speed. At 100% speed, it's going so fast and there's so much mass, it's, it's rocking the boat. Okay. But it comes over here and it, it picks up that resistor. That's, our, that's the feed point for that resistor. It goes over a little farther back and it takes a picture with the camera. And here, here's a picture doing the alignment setup. So there's a resistor. And, and it goes in places that wherever it goes. Now for all the other values of resistors that you don't uh, have, uh, okay. So for all the other values of, of resistors, I made these little 3D printed trays that, that are, have these walls that are just as wide as the eight millimeter tape or the 12 millimeter tape. <coughs> and and uh, I, I uh, lay the tape in there and so I know where the beginning of that is no matter what value is in that spot. And so uh, it, it's a reuse, okay. So I have now a, a standard position for this piece of tape and here's the camera set up. There's the picture it takes for here's where that uh, 18K resistor came from. And it knows, you tell it there's 20 of them in a strip. Here's the first one, here's the 18th one. Uh, five minutes. Okay, so uh, I hold those t pieces of tape in that little rack with double-sided tape and I've got a little stiffener underneath it because when the head comes down, it's 3D printed. That, that whole thing flexed and all the parts jumped. <laughs> so, uh, and then the other thing is when I do my first board, um, because sometimes uh, diodes get pointed the wrong way or LEDs or whatever it is. So what I do is I put, the, this is just a piece of wide masking tape, folded over double, stuck to the board. And I'm not in partic particularly interested in registration at this step. I just go through and say, pl place these LEDs place these LEDs on the board, and then I look and make sure they're, they're oriented properly. Okay. And these little uh, DO uh, 353 diodes, make sure they're oriented the proper way. You know, this one's gonna be easy to spot if it's wrong, but, but the little ones, not so much. <laughs> um, so I've got some 3D printed uh, accessory things that I've made, and I put them on uh, Thingiverse. If somebody uh, cares more about hearing that story, uh, let me know. And uh, uh, I posted on a blog spot uh, about the NeoDen when I first got it, and I'm in the process of updating that. But if you want to uh, find more information, uh, there's my email address and uh, the uh, URL for, for the blog spot thing. Uh, how are we doing? Yeah, go ahead. Questions, anybody? I'm sorry that was kind of rushed. Tess. That, that's interesting that you could do all of this. Um, how much does the machine cost now, or how much did you pay? They're around 10K, and they're still in that price tag. Uh, another 500 or something to get it here. I. I don't, I don't know I, I, exactly, but if actually they're listed on eBay and, and the price is fixed by how many of which size feeders you want. Uh, 
get very many eight millimeter feeders, <laughs> uh, none of the, maybe one of the 16s and a few of the 12s to take op amps and ICs, but basically you need almost all eight. Yes, sir. How does this compare to any of the open PNP? Um, so the open source, open hardware setups that you've seen? I, 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 was after, I was after the vision, and to be honest, if there's less expensive machines and they don't have vision, don't buy it. That, that's, you, we're only going to have more and more fine pitch parts, and, and that's, vision is essential. Yes, sir. Uh, how many uh, different components can it hold? So, <clears throat> on the, on the uh, side of the machine, um, there, there are uh, 18 feeders on one side, and depending upon the width on the other side, but, but basically 40, if they were all 8 millimeter feeders, you could have 40 parts. Um, I was just interested in why you had this machine. Um, We've got some guys that are retired that are building boards and doing things and and uh, uh, assembly is just a pain and uh, I'm, I'm not getting younger. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, um, thank you for sharing your adventure with the pick and place machine. Uh, the last time I heard a talk uh, was from the CEO of SparkFun. And he was talking about using a charm high sub three thousand uh, dollar pick and place machine, using the hardware and then you know uh, changing the software. Uh, uh, is there an online community that makes the interface for this particular machine uh, easier or? Do you know that answer? I forgot this is being recorded. The software for this is made by a, a university in China. They will make some modifications if you work with them directly, but it's never going to be a bigger commercial or thing. I, I'm, I, I think the whole pick and place community is like this big. And, and so um, other than this kind of form, I don't know how we, we would possibly get together. There's no pick P and P. Can't con, <laughs> at least that I'm aware of. All right, uh, thank you very, very, very much.